Hello, everyone. How are you doing tonight? Happy end of August. Welcome to the Center for Brooklyn History. My name is Marcia Eli. I um, get to greet you on behalf of the center and also the Brooklyn Public Library and the library's arts and culture team, BPL Presents. Tonight, we're really, really excited to present a conversation about Caribbean migration and diaspora, what those mean for Brooklyn, New York, and the country, and how festivals like next week's West Indian Day Parade keep this heritage alive and honor its historic roots. We're thrilled to be joined by professors Joshua Guild and Taisha Maddox, both experts, along with our own CBH chief historian, Dominic Jean-Louis, who will be moderating tonight. Following their conversation, there will be time for questions from all of you. We'll bring a microphone around so that everybody can hear. Uh, and um, now I'm just going to tell you a little bit about who everybody is, and we'll get started. So uh, Joshua Guild is Associate Professor of African American Studies at Princeton University. He specializes in 20th century African American social and cultural history, urban history, and the making of the modern African diaspora. His book, In the Shadows of the Metropolis, Cultural Politics and Black Communities in Post-War New York and London is forthcoming. And Taisha Maddox is an associate professor at Fordham University in the Department of African and African American Studies. Her book, A Home Away from Home, Mutual Aid, Political Activism, and Caribbean American Identity, examines the significance of early 20th century Anglophone, Caribbean, immigrant, and mutual aid societies and benevolent associations in New York City. And then uh, last but certainly not least, Dominique Jean-Louis is the chief historian at the Center for Brooklyn History at the Brooklyn Public Library. Previously, she was associate curator of history exhibitions at New York Historical Society, where she co-curated Black Citizenship in the Age of Jim Crow, among other exhibits. Her scholarship focuses on race, education, and immigration in post-civil rights era Brooklyn. Without any further ado, please help me welcome, I'm so excited that you all are here, uh, everybody to the stage. All right, I think we're on. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Good to see all your faces here in the midst of a brief heat wave. I promised air conditioning, and I hope I've sufficiently delivered. Um, but we're here today to talk a little bit more about Caribbean migration, Caribbean diaspora here in Brooklyn, but also more generally, particularly here right before the annual West Indian Day Parade, which I'm sure is probably a lot of people's um, biggest reference when it comes to Caribbean community in Brooklyn. Um, but we're gonna learn and talk a little bit more about the history that predates um, that particular celebration on Grand Army, uh, excuse me, on Eastern Parkway. Um, and a little bit more about how this community comes to be. What are the push-pull factors? And how does having this sizable Caribbean uh, population here in Brooklyn change what it means to be black, change what it means to be Brooklyn? Um, so I really want to get into it. Um, but understanding that there's probably a real range in this room of people's familiarity with Caribbean history and identity, um, I thought we could just start out with some terms, right? So um, could you each maybe talk a little bit more about, in your work, in your classes, how do you refer to Caribbean people? Do you use the term Caribbean? Do you use West Indian? Uh, West Indian? Do you use them differently? And how's that changed over time? And how does racial identity, colonization, language play into how you use these terms to even start to define this group? Hello? Okay. Thank you so much, Dominique, for having us. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight um, on this warm afternoon. <laughs> Um, I use the terms uh, West Indian um, and Caribbean in my work and in my classes when I teach. Uh, I know that 
recently there's been a push not to use the term West Indian, but I see that more as a push that comes in academia. I don't know, Joshua, you can tell me if you've seen that as well. Um, but colloquially, um, my mom's family is from the Caribbean and they use the term West Indian. They refer to themselves as West Indian. Um, so I don't see a problem with using that term. I also use it to be more encompassing of um, the greater Caribbean region. So when I talk about um, West Indian, I'm also referring to Guyana, um, people who identify with the West Indian heritage. Um, so uh, someone from Guyana or Panama or Belize are also included in that identity of West Indian um, or even Bermuda, um, which is not in the Caribbean proper, um, can uh, identify with that term West Indian as opposed to Caribbean. So when I use it, I use it to speak of the wider circum Caribbean um, and those who identify with a West Indian heritage as opposed to Caribbean. I think I use it similarly in part because it's a historical term. It's a term that comes up in the archives and my historical subjects who I'm writing about in the 20th century primarily use West Indian to self-identify. But I, but I do think um, that one, it tends to exclude on language grounds. Right, so we're really talking about Anglophone folks, English-speaking people. So there's a lot to the Caribbean, right? That does not include you know, people who are primarily English speakers. So the term Caribbean, therefore, becomes more inclusive. Um, but also, I think contemporarily, it's, it's just less in favor. People, you know, people tend to use it less now. So my students, for example, um, at Princeton, who are either first or se second generation, tend not to identify themselves as West Indian as such. Um, so. Those would be the caveats, but in terms of my teaching and certainly in my writing, uh, I use West Indian Caribbean fairly interchangeably. Interesting, and it's interesting to see that generational divide even mm -hmm. between your parents and your family and, mm -hmm. and even kids today, um, that it's, these seems to be terms that are changing over time and kind of as we go through history, maybe there's going to be other terminology that springs to mind. Um, so. Being West Indian, might, being Caribbean or, and or West Indian <laughs> myself, um, something you often hear is people say things like same people, different boats, right? Understanding that the larger trans, uh, transatlantic slave trade brought some of the same groups of people, some of whom ended up in the U.S. Um, and, and being enslaved here, some in the Caribbean, some in South America. So there's this kind of longer history that ties New York's uh, uh, black community to a larger Caribbean um, uh, kind of Latin American uh, con connection to, his, to um, Caribbean identity and this kind of larger slave trade. Um, and even in my own research in doing re uh, history research here for the Center for Brooklyn History, it turns out that some of the first enslaved people that were brought to Brooklyn were captured by Dutch pirates in the Caribbean from Spanish ships. So it quite literally is some of the same people who are coming in different boats. Um, I like thinking about some of those black Caribbeans could have been black Brooklynites and vice versa. Um, so to keep setting the scene of how this community is established here, could you take us through a little bit about how Caribbean people end up becoming Caribbean Americans here in the U.S.? How early does immigration begin? Um, were Caribbeans welcomed the same as other immigrant groups? And if you could maybe share some of the immigration policy shifts that might have colored those, um, the sense of that welcome into the United States or lack thereof. I guess I'll start. Um, <laughs> so the period that I look at, I am very purposeful in looking at this period, um, the turn of the 20th century. Um, my research starts Sorry, my research starts in 1890, um, specifically because when we tend to think of Caribbean immigration to the US, we tend to think of the boom in the 1960s and onward. And so I wanted to show um, with my work, um, and of course there are uh, seminal works that do this work um, as well, Winston James, Irma Walken Owens. Um, but I wanted to look at this earlier period to solidify that Caribbean immigrants have been a part of the American fabric for a very long time and have had been contributing to African American and uh, American history um, more widely. And so I start at 1890, but we have instances of Caribbean immigrants coming as early as the 1830s, 1840s, um, not in huge numbers um, that like we see um, in that first wave in the 1900s, but we do have a significant number of people who are coming in those periods. 
I sort of come to this history through it in a different direction, and I actually come through African American history. And, and when I started this project, that's this, which will be the forthcoming book, as a dissertation, I came at it with an interest in African American and U.S. Black Southerners migrating uh, from the South to the North, and then the so-called Great Migration. Um, and I, I centered my research on New York and eventually on Brooklyn specifically. And I very quickly realized that I couldn't tell that story of the transformation of black Brooklyn as a, as a US centric African American story and that there were, that there were Caribbean Americans or West Indians sort of everywhere in the, in the early 20th century and, you know, through the 20th century. And so that opened up a kind of range of histories that I was sort of less familiar with at that time of Caribbean migration. The original vision for this project was actually going to connect Toronto and London and, and New York or, 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 you know, Canada. The UK, because the, the kind of range of overlapping migrations is really what's so interesting to me. And, and so my work really try, tries to focus on that. Um, and my own project takes, starts up in the 1930s, in the, in the, in the Depression, with, um, <clears throat> excuse me, with black Southerners coming to the US, excuse me, coming, coming to New York City at the same time as uh, and encountering um, folks from Barbados, from, from Trinidad, from Jamaica, uh, other islands here in New York City and living not in really in separate enclaves, but really living more or less side by side in central Brooklyn. Uh, I focus primarily on, on Bedford Stuyvesant, but later in Crown Heights. Um, and so those patterns of kind of interlock, interlocking or overlapping diasporas are what's so sort of interesting to me. Yeah, it's so fascinating to think about these, these moments when immigration seems to crest a little bit and then maybe fall and then come back. So we talked a little bit about some of how people, how and where people are coming into the U.S. I wonder if you might share a little bit more about the push factors. What are, what's making uh, Caribbean people decide to leave the islands, leave the weather, um, and come <laughs> here to New York? Um, and maybe if you, in your research, have encountered um, specific stories of how people, um, why people made that journey and how they found their new home on, on first arrival. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I think one of the sort of defining features of black history is a history of migration. Right? We can tell the story over centuries, uh, but if we focus only just even on the 19th and, and 20th centuries, or early 21st centuries, um, a, range of, a range of push and pull factors, as, as the scholars call it, but within those push and pull factors are a million individual decisions, individual choices, family choices. Um, but I think one of the things that's, I think, so notable about the Caribbean as a region is its history of migration, right? Migration between the islands, migration from uh, the islands to uh, various parts of uh, so-called Latin America, um, whether it's to the Panama Canal zone in the early 20th century, whether it's going um, uh, to uh, Cuba from Jamaica, uh, Barbados, all, I mean, so much migration. So, so much of a part of the fabric of the history of, of, of the Caribbean is a history of migration. So it's really, I, I think, um, uh, an element of kind of adaptation to changing economic circumstances uh, and, and other things. And so there, are, so there are opportunities that people are leaving and they are sending money back. So this history of remittances, which we can talk about more, is, is, is sort of predates any of this migration to the US or, you know, or, or uh, uh, you know, North America proper. Um, so there's that, but there's also these family networks, right? So one person goes ahead Right, often a male laborer, but not always, will go ahead, sometimes send for the family, or this will then you know, lead to you know, kind of this chain migration happening. Um, and so, I mean, I can think in terms of, of Brooklyn stories, I mean, a couple, I mean, one would be the great uh, pianist and composer Randy Weston, um, who was a, just a legendary towering figure here, here in Brooklyn and then worldwide. Um, his father was Jamaican, a Jama descendant of Maroons, um, but had come and had come to the U.S. Uh, initially through the Panama Canal Zone, then through Cuba, and eventually to the U.S. So, so you have Jamaica, Panama, Cuba, U.S. He lands here in the 1920s, uh, meets an African American woman uh, from Virginia. They have a child, Randy Weston. They raise him. Uh, Randy Weston's father, Frank Weston, was a, a Pan-Africanist. He was a Garveyite, right? And so there's this sense of those ideologies traveling with people but also being nurtured here in Brooklyn. And we can tell many such stories of people uh, kind of moving through another figure that people are very familiar with probably here, Shirley Chisholm, uh, 
uh, who was born here uh, to Barbadian parents, um, but spent much of her childhood. She was sent back. Her parents were, were striving immigrants, and, and, and they were trying to get a foothold here in New York. And as part of their way of doing that was to send her back, her and her sisters back home to Barbados. And she did her primary school in Barbados before coming back here to, 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 to grow up. And again, that's, I think, a feature. We sometimes think about, uh, at least in popular uh, culture, of, of migration and immigration being a kind of one-way street. People just leave, they never they go and, you know, but it's actually much more complicated, it's much more back and forth, it's, there's constant kind of connections, whether it's money being sent, whether it's visits back home, or in the case of, of the, the St. Hill Chisholm family, um, you know, going for a little while, coming back, and that kind of movement. It also kind of upsets the narrative of opportunity. Like you leave for opportunity, you find it, and you stay. That sometimes, like with Shirley Chisholm's family, maybe opportunity is there, and then it's maybe not so there, and you have to adapt, as you're saying, for the family. Maybe send the kids back while you chase enough opportunity to make that possible. Yeah, I was going to say, um, I think that's also a really good point about this migration, that it's not often linear from point A to point B. There, it's very circuitous. Um, a lot of the immigrants who are coming uh, to New York, this is not their first migration. They were either in Central America working on the canal or one of the railroads in, um, uh, why am I blinking? <laughs> one of the, in Costa Rica, right? Or on Honduras. Um, or they were working in South America and then they come to the US. So for many, um, many migrants, this is a second migration for them. Also, uh, many come with the idea that this is going to just be transitory. They're only going to come for a little bit, and then they're going to go home, and then they end up staying, or vice versa. Um, I think it's also really important that Joshua pointed out this idea that they often set up networks for themselves first. Um, I talk about in my book um, the female-led chains of migration that occur um, in the early 20th century, where we have lots of women coming as domestics. Um, setting up households, getting jobs for their other female relatives, um, and then bringing their family. And it was really important, this idea, this transnationalism that was happening in which uh, people were raising other people's children, grandparents, aunts, um, and then they were sending money. So there was this, still this very intimate connection uh, to the Caribbean. Once they leave, they don't just forget about their home countries. There's still a very intimate tie um, to the Caribbean. Yeah, I think that idea of a circuit is really valuable, that New York generally and Brooklyn specifically is just one place where families might end up, might spend some time, and then move on. So, Taisha, you talked a little bit about this, about networks being set up here to support Caribbean immigrants. Um, and I think one of the things that your book is so helpful with is really, as you mentioned, talking about that earlier wave of migration, especially since, as um, Joshua points out, that's it coincides with other internal migrations of African-American people coming up from the U.S. South. Um, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit both about what's happening in, let's call it, black New York at the time of that earlier wave of migration, and also how understanding that earlier history changes your sense of what it is to be Caribbean-American today. Yeah. Um, I think, so when I initially got um, interested in this subject, it was because in reading history of the Harlem Renaissance or early 20th century history, I'd learn about all these great African-American figures. And then I'd find out, oh, wait, but they're Caribbean immigrants or, or they're, they're descended from Caribbean immigrants. This is important. Why are we not talking about this? Because I think, not to say that there is an exceptionalism um, to being Caribbean, but I think there's something to, say, to be said about leaving your home, going to a new place, and creating something for yourself. And so I was really interested in this uh, migration and what migration does to a person um, in terms of achievement or establishing themselves. And so in this early period, we see, uh, as Joshua brought up earlier, we see Caribbean immigrants uh, moving into the same neighborhoods as African Americans. Uh, many of them are taking similar jobs, especially the period that I study and the group that I study. I study the Afro-Anglophone Caribbean. And so from all outward appearances, they look like black Americans, and so they're treated like black Americans. They have to live in the same place. They're relegated to the same jobs. And so they form community amongst themselves. Um, the mutual aid societies and benevolent associations that I look at were also one way for them to cope and deal with um, living in a new country um, and finding a place for themselves in this new country. Because at the same time, while they are seemingly 
being able to fit into the African American community, there's still lots of struggles that they face as immigrants in a new country. And so many of these uh, organizations were welcoming organizations, helping people get facilitated um, and set up in the US in order so that they could thrive eventually. If that answered your question. No, it totally does. And I think it's helpful for us to think about this not just being about individual stories. You know, this person went, they achieved X, Y, Z for themselves, that we're really thinking about a network that involves black Americans, involves Caribbeans, but um, makes it possible for through mutual aid, as you talk about in your book, and just building community for people to thrive. Because not everyone can just do it on their own. In fact, yeah. probably very few people can just kind of build a new life in a new place they don't have any um, roots in. So um, similarly, Joshua, your book is also about black community formation, but you also bring in London, this other kind of global capital. You mentioned that initially there was going to be Toronto in there and kind of um, it ended up just being about London and New York. Um, and I'm so fascinated, especially since you started off wanting to talk about, you know, Brooklyn specifically or you're interested in Brooklyn. What are some of the differences that came up as you were doing this research between London and the U.S.? Is it, are there differences in terms of Who's coming from which island? Are there differences in terms of what work people are finding or what channels people are using to make their migration? Or are there no differences at all? And some people just randomly <laughs> decide to go to, Bri um, to go to Britain or come to Brooklyn. So um, what are some of the, the differences and maybe some of the similarities between these two global capital cities? There's a, there's a significant difference in scale the scale of the black communities in the two places, and so there, and then therefore the experience of the of the Caribbean migrants in the two places is quite different. It's particularly in the in the in the twentieth century, in the early part of the twentieth century. Um, there's the intimacy of colonialism um, that I think is so important for the UK story. Um, that's, that's a little bit different uh, here in the U.S. And so, we, and by that I mean um, the folks in the in the, in the English speaking Caribbean have British educations. And they are, they are British subjects. Uh, here I'm talking in the, in the 1920s and 1930s, uh, you know, pre-independence. Um, and so they have a familiarity, or at least they think they do, with the mother country. There's, this, there's, this, there's a language of the mother country, right? And so there's a sort of sense of, of connection, if not belonging, but certainly connection. Um, there are some changing immigration um, uh, policies that sort of sh shape who goes where when. Um, and so we know in 1924 here, there's, a, there's, a, there's restrictions on immigration here that se severely curtail uh, the number of Caribbean immigrants who are able to come to this country. Um, people still do come, but by the 1930s, it's, it's actually a net loss. There are more people leaving, going back home uh, than, than, than are coming in. And that will change by 1965 quite dramatically. But in the intervening period between the mid-1920s and the 1960s, uh, the UK liberalizes its immigration regime in a certain kind of way. This passage of what's called the British Nationality Act, which is, which is meant to sort of uh, create a kind of uniform category of citizen and subject. Right? So to make no distinction between those born in the British Isles and those born in the colonies. Right? They, have, they basically have the same standing as, 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 as citizens of a sort. Uh, and has, it is meant to sort of solidify this fading empire, right? British Empire is on, on its decline, and so this is meant to sort of shore up Canada and Australia and India, all these, right? And it, and it has a kind of um, unforeseen consequence of essentially facilitating the kind of mass migration of Jamaicans and Barbadians and, and, and others uh, to the UK um, to fill uh, the post-war labor shortages um, created by World War II. Um, and so we have about 150,000 folks leaving the Caribbean and coming to the UK in a very about 15 year period or so. Um, and then that uh, liberalization quickly gets reversed in 1962. The US liberalizes, I'm using these terms very loosely, but I think it's, it's helpful for our purposes here, uh, liberalizes in the 1965 Hart Seller Act here in the US, which then changes things and so, so it shifts the, shifts the so-called flow um, between. Um, but, this, but this sense that uh, many West Indians have about what they will encounter in the UK and then their actual experience in London is quite, you know, quite jarring for many of them. We have m many examples of, of, of well-known writers and political activists uh, active in the UK in the 1950s and 60s who, who write about this and campaign uh, on, on the kind of uh, contours of British racism, which is something they, they had not necessarily anticipated in the same way. Whereas there's a familiarity with Jim Crow, what Jim Crow is, what it might be, uh, even though uh, people also here come here and, and end up struggling against it as well. I think that's so fascinating that there's kind of like a, 
uh, levers being pulled on up, moving up and moving down with the UK and with um, the United States, kind of welcoming, welcoming more, welcoming less, and then you see that resulting. And then I'm sure as we are talking about this circuitous um, pathway exists too, or maybe some families are going to the UK and then later coming to the US. It's one of my favorite ties to Caribbean immigration and hip hop. Buster Rhymes' family, when he starts <laughs> acting up in high school, they send him to go live with his, their, his family over in London to kind of straighten him out a little bit. So we also know that maybe some of these paths um, move in a circle and not just unidirectionally. Um, so Taish, you talked a little bit about how your book fo focuses on women specifically and these women's mutual aid um, organizations, and you talked a little bit about domestic work, but I was hoping you can take us uh, through a little bit what kinds of industries would be welcoming to these Caribbean women who are coming in, um, both maybe in the earlier uh, uh, waves of immigration and then a little bit later. Um, and another thing that I was really intrigued about with your work is how religion plays a role. And obviously, religion across the Caribbean is going to look a lot of different ways. So how does that end up factoring into the way that communities are formed once Caribbean immigrants arrive to the United States and New York specifically. Yeah, so a lot of the immigrants who come, they come for job opportunities. And specifically in this time, um, the number one industry for black women was domestic work. So uh, being caregivers, house um, housekeepers, um, taking care of the home. Um, there was a push at this point where women were um, going back to work. Um, in other industries. And so there was a need for uh, caregivers to do this work. And so West Indian women um, took on this, uh, this, this uh, job. And so we see um, a lot of networks um, pulling um, for uh, Caribbean women to come specifically. There was, um, I'm trying to remember the name of the program uh, that they set up to have uh, women coming directly from the Anglophone Caribbean to uh, New York. But anyway, so we see uh, caregiving as a number one position that many Caribbean women were taking. Uh, there was work in garment factories. Uh, we see lots of Caribbean women who are working in garment factories. I'm trying to think of the other industries. Um, for Caribbean males, um, uh, working as sleeper porters, uh, car porter, Pullman porters um, was another very popular job, um, elevator operators. And many of these uh, Caribbean immigrants that were coming, especially when we look at the early 20th century, they were often middle class um, and highly educated. But because of Jim Crow racism at the time, they couldn't take on uh careers or positions in their chosen field because of American racism. And so they were often relegated to these kinds of positions. Um, we know also Caribbean men took on jobs uh, working in the US military as well because those were positions that were available to them. Um, and so we have, this is one of the reasons why we see this chain migration um, through these labor positions that uh, many Caribbean men and women were taking. Uh, let's see. Um, trying to remember the other question, religion. Religion. <laughs> uh, so uh, I look at these mutual aid societies as a way, one, they were advertising jobs also to in order to create more networks for themselves. Um, so they were advertising these jobs for women to come over. And we know that they also set up these organizations. In many cases, they were running them in local churches. Uh, the Episcopal Church was very big in the Caribbean, in the Anglophone Caribbean. And so many of them set up churches here um, in Harlem and in Brooklyn. And so many of the mutual aid societies, if they didn't have a building themselves, they would set up their meetings, um, they would host events, and they'd always do it in conjunction with churches. And so religion, while not the primary focus of these mutual aid societies, were always in the, was always in the background in terms of having Sunday service or um, hosting events at the churches. And so religion in some ways played a part, but not the foremost part of these mutual aid societies. That's really interesting. So it's yeah. even religion as an institution as much as it is kind of a, a network and a particular yeah. faith community. Absolutely. Um, that's so fascinating. And I'm interested in culture more generally because mm -hmm. something that you both have spoken about is that as Caribbean Americans or as, as Caribbean people migrate to uh, New York City specifically, they're living side by side with um, black American communities. Yeah. Some of them, you know, coming 
uh, for generations from New York City, some of them more recently arrived from the U.S. South. And um, you've both spoken a little bit about Garvey. Um, Josh, you spoke a little bit about Shirley Chisholm. Um, we know also I mentioned Hip Hop, Cool Herc, uh, Biggie. These are all kinds of uh, figures that we know more generally as New York figures, but specifically represent this Caribbean history. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk to us a little bit more about how New York City's Caribbean population as it grows and as it changes throughout the 20th century really changes the cultural scene and specifically black culture. So are there any big main areas of influence? Maybe you could talk a little bit about Garvey, for example, but I'm also thinking about music and food and dance and language. Um, and especially if there are any legacies of Caribbean immigration that maybe people don't know are Caribbean, but um, are can be linked back to this long um, wait, this long and consecutive waves of Caribbean migration. The first one that I'm thinking of immediately when I think about people who don't you don't realize are of West Indian heritage is uh, Louise Little, who is Malcolm X's mother. And we know that she she's from Grenada. She was born in Grenada. And she follows also this like circuitous route of migration where her family goes to Toronto first, and then they go to, um, or to Canada. I believe it's Toronto, but they'd go to Canada first, and then they come to the US. And so a lot of people, when they talk about Malcolm X, they don't mention that his mom is from Grenada and also a Garveyite. Right. And so many of these ideas that Malcolm X is instilled with um, from a very young age comes from this uh, Caribbean uh, traditional background that his mother instills in him. So I think that's definitely one that immediately stands out to me when I'm thinking about, oh, surprise, guess who has Caribbean heritage? Um, I don't know if you. I mean, I think music is the most one of the most vital areas of culture that we can think of in, 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 in this context and something that I write about quite a bit. I talked about Randy Weston as an example. Randy Weston growing up talks, you know, he comes from this family that's, you know, on his mother's side, African-American, his father's side, uh, Caribbean. His father ran a restaurant, which was this, and, and was this kind of um, ardent Pan-Africanist. And so the, the, the ethos of the restaurant was, was sort of reflected that. Um, but, but, but Weston writes in his memoir, and when I, when I interviewed him about uh, sort of being in the neighborhood in Bed-Stuy in the 1940s and having the music being all the music, all the music of the diaspora, I mean, like quite literally. I mean, so he's hearing jazz, he's hearing blues, what, what will become R&B, but it's, but it's mento from Jamaica, it's, it's calypso, it's what they would call Spanish music or Latin music, um, but it, because his dad was this Pan-Africanist, they're also hearing African music with the 19, 1940s and 50s, um, and that all becomes an influence on his own composition, his, his uh, career as a, as a jazz musician. I think it's also also just reflective of that that era. Uh, Max Roach, another famous jazz musician, grew, grew up with Randy Weston. He's in the same kind of milieu. Um, Calypso, this music that we associate, you know, so closely for good reason with with Carnival, um, has a long history in New York, and we can talk more about it. But uh, it's a music that really doesn't exist. Um, separated from these other musics, right? It sort of really come, it develops alongside in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, being performed alongside both folk music and blues, but also jazz. Um, and so there's this, this incredible overlap uh, and kind of cross-pollination. And then the most famous, of course, is hip hop, um, which, which has you know, these real deep ties to Jamaican dance hall culture um, from the 60s and 70s, um, but also is, um, help is steeped in and helping to kind of perpetuate disco and, and, and black soul and funk and all these. I mean, so it's all this cross pollination, cross pollination, uh, which is, I think, which is so exciting about in music and, 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 and can um, help us really understand Caribbean influences in a really important way. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that you point out that there are these kind of melting pot effects. I think we think about New York City in a large sense as a melting pot, but even within individual neighborhoods that might, um, have a particular demographic because of things like the racism in the housing industry where you will have particular groups all kind of in the mix together and that produces some of these um, these forms that we know of as black or we know of as New York City art forms that really arise because of those kind of micro melting pots. Um, and I'm wondering if there's any other kind of uh, cultural uh, uh, legacies of this Caribbean migration thinking about music or, fa or thinking about music again or fashion, um, dance, those kinds of things that really feel as though they owe their genesis to um, Caribbean migrations or Caribbean migrants who um, kind of push them forward or food. 
it's, um, it's dinner time. Yeah, definitely food. <laughs> when you think of Brooklyn, or I think New York in general, you can't think of it without thinking of the the fusions of uh, Caribbean food that's been infused. Um, even like creating modern Caribbean cuisine here in New York and taking aspects of um, what we think are traditional African-American cuisine and, and introducing it into Caribbean, um, traditional Caribbean dishes. I also think one thing that we tend to forget is that these Caribbean immigrants, for many, for many of the people, especially when I'm thinking of the earlier period, um, someone from Trinidad probably hadn't met someone from from Jamaica before. And so they don't think of themselves necessarily in the beginning as part of this Caribbean, larger Caribbean community. And so when they come to the, the diaspora, then they forge these networks and uh, realize this, uh, this shared identity, shared traditions and tra shared values. And along with that comes the melting pot of different kinds of music fusing together, different kinds of food and styles of cooking also uh, fusing together. And so we see that happening in the diaspora in ways that we don't see it back in individual countries in the, in the Caribbean. So I think that's really interesting. Um, also, I think just, um, I wrote a piece on Caribbean New York and calling New York uh, capital of the Caribbean um, because we see uh, many of these fusions of Caribbean um, food and dance and clothing um, as part of Brooklyn. Even slang, like some of the slang that we use comes directly from the Caribbean. And so I think we can't think of Brooklyn history or New York history without thinking of these instances in which the Caribbean and Caribbean immigration has influenced that. I was reading something about um, one of the most popular food items in New York City public schools, and apparently the beef patties were like in the top five. And I'm like, a Jamaican beef patty as part of like the most popular food in New York, that says something about Caribbean immigrants and their influence on even our food in, in the public schools, right? So I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, I've always thought there's nothing more Brooklyn than going to a pizza shop and getting a Jamaican beef patty. <laughs> Um, so speaking of Brooklyn and the parts of its Caribbean community that we all know and love, of course I want to uh, make sure we have time to talk about the West Indian Day Parade, because obviously by some metrics it's the largest parade in America. It's this huge cultural explosion that happens every year. Um, and in some ways that's appropriate, right, that it's this big, but there are also ways that carnival specific, or this particular iteration of carnival, and of course it exists in London and iterations of it exist back in the Caribbean as well, um, what do you think the bigness of this event gets right about representing Brooklyn's large Caribbean community? And are there maybe other aspects of what it is to be Caribbean in New York and Brooklyn specifically either today or historically that maybe don't get enough attention or maybe get left out a little bit when we focus so much on the West Indian Day Parade? Um, so you could speak a little bit to its genesis, um, maybe talk a little about its um, origins in Harlem, and then um, how it represents or maybe doesn't represent the changing Caribbean community here. You know, I mean, I think the first place to start is is in Trinidad, right? The the, the carnival, as such, is a, is a Trinidadian tradition. Has other iterations in other places, but it's but it's the predominant form is, in, is comes from Trinidad. Um, the immigrants who are here in the 1920s are tr are interested in trying to replicate, in some ways, you know, what they had back home. You know, all immigrants have some sense of of loss, some sense of, of, of things that are left behind that they can't, that they aren't able to bring with them. And, and so there's this kind of group of uh, Caribbean migrants here, Trinidadian migrants in particular, who, are, who want to replicate. So they start with indoor kind of fets, really, really masquerade balls and parties, essentially, in ballrooms. Um, and then it's uh, an, an effort to bring it out onto the street. But of course, the traditional uh, carnival time is, is late winter not really too uh, applicable here in, in, in New York City. Um, and so in the 1930s, so they're doing these things in the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, in, in the late 1940s, uh, they uh, apply for a permit to bring it out onto the streets of Harlem, onto the city. Um, and that's when it gets moved to the Labor Day time, right? Kind of more, more applicable time weather-wise, the traditional end of summer here and so forth. And so it starts out as a, as a, as a parade up in Harlem. Um, Down Lennox it, Avenue. What's that? <laughs> Down Lennox Avenue. Down Lennox Avenue, Avenue right? You know, 50,000 or so people at first, and then grows quite a bit. And it's, uh, but it's really 
a Trinidadian event in the beginning, right? And, and I think it sort of takes time for it to become this, this more pan, pan West Indian, pan, pan Caribbean uh, event. It grows, the African Americans in the neighborhood don't really know what to do with this thing, because it's not really a traditional parade in, in the ways that uh, you know, other kind of civic parades happen here in, in the city, and there's some tensions and, and criticisms of, of what, what's on display in terms of how one comports oneself in public, uh, let, let us say. Um, they eventually lose their permit after about a decade, and by this time, and this is now we're into the mid-1960s, um, Brooklyn has become the really kind of epicenter of Caribbean New York um, due to overcrowding in Harlem and various other factors, uh, and then gets reconstituted here. But very, very kind of slowly, and then by the, by the late 60s and early 70s, it, it starts to really grow um, into, in, into what it becomes today. To your question about sort of what it gets right, I think it's that sense of openness, right? So it's not just a, a Trinidadian thing. It's open to really all islands um, and, and, and people from different traditions sort of make their way and make a space within the, 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 the carnival. Um, and I think it also has become such a cultural institution that it, that it has really deep political significance for a uh, Korean American community here in, in Brooklyn or in, in New York more broadly and to, to the point where all politicians come to the West Indian Day Parade. Every mayor, every, you know, I went to the West Indian Day Parade maybe, I don't know, 15 years ago, and I saw Chuck Schumer out there. He's there every year. He's there, he's there all the time. Every year. <laughs> Real awkward, <laughs> but I'll give him credit, you know, he, he, he's out there, you know, and, and, but, but it's, it's one half, if you're gonna be a politician and you're gonna, and you're gonna earn the votes of this really now incredibly uh, powerful um, voting block in New York State, you have to be at the West Indian Day Parade. So I think those are two things that the, the, the parade sort of does well and reflects, I think, the diversity of, of uh, this community. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I also think one thing that it does uh, well, um, we see in comparing Caribbean carnivals in the Caribbean and Caribbean carnivals in the diaspora is this idea that it's um, a way to pass on tradition to children. And so there is an aspect of like a children's carnival that's always part of every carnival. And this is, I think, especially important in the diaspora for people looking to connect with their Caribbean heritage in some way. So um, carnival is not only just the music or the dance, it's also art, it's a form of art. Um, and so I think passing on this tradition, I know people who participate in carnival now, um, either um, in the Caribbean or in New York, because they participated at the West Indian Day Parade in Brooklyn and they felt connected to the, their culture in ways that they couldn't. Um, not every family is able to travel back to the Caribbean. And so this is one way for them to uh, outwardly show this connection to the Caribbean um, and to feel um, some sense of community. And so I think that's really important. And I think that is one of the things that it gets right in the fact that um, it it's, not just a dance party or music or like fun, beautiful costumes. It's also passing on this cultural tradition. I'm trying to remember the other question you asked. <laughs> um, are there things that maybe get left out of the conversation mm -hmm. because the West Indian Day Parade feels mm -hmm. like the biggest thing about being Caribbean yeah. in Brooklyn? Are there things that maybe yeah. aren't represented by that as a singular event? Yeah, I think sometimes the history of Carnival um, and the understanding. I teach, um, as I was mentioning to you earlier, I teach a Caribbean history class every um, semester. And I focus on carnival and the traditions of carnival, some of the aspects of carnival. And a lot of my students, even my students who are of Caribbean heritage, are really surprised at some of the aspects that they don't know about the history of carnival. And I think that's one of the things. Why do we do these certain traditions? Why do we have juve? Where does that come from? Like, I think some of those traditions are a little bit lost um, in the pageantry or the dance and the costumes, um, the, the history and meaning and significance behind a lot of those. Um, also, I wanted to point out that uh, not only is it um, a lar the largest uh, Caribbean carnival in the US, but it's also the largest outside of the Caribbean, um, larger than Notting Hill, larger than Caravana in Toronto. Um, and then as a result of the success of the West Indian Day Parade, we also have offshoots. So like the Puerto Rican Day Parade or the Dominican Day or the Haitian Day Parade, Flag Day, that all comes because of the West Indian Day Parade. So it sets the, the bar. And then we have these offshoots of uh, more island specific parades that come after. It's an interesting point you make that this kind of remains the biggest celebration of these kind of larger carnival celebrations. And something I know that 
I've noticed over the course of my lifetime, and I'm guessing you all have too, is how much that changes now that we have social media. I think I never had heard of Notting Hills Con Carnival, never kind of thought about what that looks like, or crop over or these other different traditions across the Caribbean. And now, of course, we have so much easier access to understanding how Carnival looks across the world. How do you think either social media has changed um, what the carnival looks like today and how it might change to um, uh, in what, what it means to be Caribbean American, a Caribbean American identity, given that you can be in community and network with people who are halfway across the world? Do you think that place and, you know, specifically Eastern Parkway is going to be as important as this larger global network now that people are connected instantaneously through a phone? I'm not sure how much social media has changed the carnival, actually. I mean, I, I do think there is, the, the, uh, what, what I do think has changed carnival, and, and all the carnivals, is a, is a kind of commercialization of it, yeah. which, I, which we might connect to social media, but I don't think it's actually this, quite the same thing. Um, and so, I mean, I love the point you make, Taisha, about um, the, both the history, but also some of the artistry that, that's maybe lost or overlooked. I mean, I, I think of a musical art form like Calypso, which has changed over time and has been displaced by Soka and other kinds of things. Um, but just that, or even, even you know, the masquerade, I mean, the artistry of, of, of creating the costumes, right? I mean, there, there, are, there are people who just come out on, on the day and they put on a t-shirt or put wave a flag or whatever, but there are people who also, um, you know, spend the entire year mm -hmm. Making their costumes, and they're 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 part of a whole camp, and the, you know, and then people pay money to to join the camp, and all that stuff, and that sometimes I think gets overlooked in in the kind of more commercial aspects of it, which which involves pop stars and pop music, you know, coming to New York and to London and Toronto, and all all the rest. Um, so I mean, yes, I think it's I think the social media does connect people for sure, and and, and opens up people's um, awareness of other other traditions and other ways of celebrating, but the vitality of all these carnivals is actually place-based, right? And there have been tremendous battles over place, over the, over, over the ability to hold this tradition in the same place every year. And we see in the ways these things have been policed, particularly here in New York, but I think even more so in London, but at least equally so, um, real battles over place about what it means to do this thing here. And there have been calls historically over the last 50 years to move the West Indian Day Parade somewhere else. Um, there was a there was a kind of in that early first decade here in Brooklyn, um, there was a kind of a constituency that wanted to move it to to Fifth Avenue, mm -hmm. to, for it to be a kind of civic parade in the same kind of way that the that, that other you know kind of St. Patrick's Day Parade, other other uh, major parades are. And there were others who said, No, we are here in Brooklyn. This is our place, and it belongs here. And then we see as Brooklyn has transformed, as, as many of these neighborhoods adjoining and, and, and neighborhoods have become gentrified and who lives there has changed, I think we're gonna see those battles continue uh, over, over belonging. So I think that none of that necessarily has to do with social media, but I do, but I do think the question of place becomes uh, ever more important. Yeah, and I think definitely, I think that's a, oh, sorry. <laughs> I think that's a problem we see mostly in the diaspora, not necessarily in the Caribbean, but in the diaspora. I'm thinking of um, Caravana and the way it has been policed um, more recently um, in terms of fencing and not allowing it to be a street festival in the way that it has traditionally been a street festival, similar to Notting Hill, um, and how um, there has been a lot more um, a smaller, like trying to concentrate it into a smaller and smaller area, almost like to the point of erasure, right? Um, and I feel the same way about the West Indian Day Parade when I was a kid. There was definitely not as large of a police presence as there is now um, with the carnival. In many cases, they make it feel unsafe sometimes to go out and enjoy carnival because if, if you're seeing this huge police presence, then it must be dangerous, right? Um, and I think that's part of this battle for place and space that comes with uh, a gentrification of a neighborhood, right? And the people who are celebrating or and have traditionally celebrated in this area are no, ne not necessarily welcomed in that neighborhood anymore. And what does that mean, right? Yeah. These are really interesting questions of what it is today. So we're going to move uh, in about uh, one more. I have one more question, but we're going to move to Q&A shortly. So if you want to start uh, formulating your questions so you can be crisp and concise when you ask them, uh, now's the time. Um, and so just to close up in terms of the question I have for you both, um, 
This one's just kind of for fun, and part of being the historian of the Center for Brooklyn History is just starting neighborhood wars every day. Uh, so obviously, as you've both talked about, we see Caribbean representation across New York City, across the five boroughs. Um, and you shared a little bit about this in terms of how uh, music patterns kind of emerge from some of the same communities. But can you share anything about micro-migration patterns? Are there people from specific islands who end up in specific neighborhoods? And is there any way that that manifests maybe for someone who can't spot the difference? Um, but if you're kind of an insider, you might know that, oh, that's a particularly Antiguan way of, of cooking peas and rice or whatever the case may be. Are there any micro-neighborhoods either here in Brooklyn or elsewhere in New York? This is the perfect weekend to, to find out because there'll be flags everywhere and you will see. <laughs> you will see where everyone is from. Um, I immediately think of, uh, and this is new to me in the last, in realizing in the last like two or three years, in Farce Hill, Queens, there's a huge Guyanese contingent out there. And so we see um, in areas of Queens, a large, large uh, Guyanese community. Um, there's Little Haiti, which is right uh, near Flat or in Flatbush, right, um, right next to Little Caribbean, <laughs> which is the wider area. Um, I know my my mom's family is from St. Lucia, and there is a huge St. Lucian contingent all over Crown Heights. Um, so we see lots of uh, St. Lucians in the Crown Heights. Uh, large Caribbean immigration to the Bronx, um, the West Bronx. We see a lot of uh, Jamaican. Migration um, to the Bronx. Um, I'm trying to think of field. Yeah, <laughs> I'm trying to think of other areas. Can you think of? Um... This is really an audience question because I think there, I think there are, there are answers out here for sure. Um, but I guess one thing I would just also say is that this also then extends us beyond the five boroughs, right? Because yeah. part of the story of the last 50 years is actually people moving out into Westchester, into Long Island, and in, in, in Jersey. And so I think there Long are Island there especially. are there are um, lots of enclaves that you know, that have connections to 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 either Harlem or the Bronx or or, or Brooklyn in particular, um, but are no longer there for various reasons. Um, and so I think it's actually a bigger kind of region no question than a, than a city or even borough specific. And related to gentrification, as you both were talking yeah, about, absolutely. you know, how can yeah. people, um, are people able to stay in their neighborhoods? Mm -hmm. um, so we have ushers with microphones so we'll be able to go across, seeing a couple of hands poke up, um, but hands are shooting up. <laughs> I know, I, I've forgotten things. <laughs> There's a rebuttal. Um, go ahead. Hi, good evening. I just wanted to offer a clarification. Um, I am a Jamaican nurse. And when the question was asked regarding how people migrated here, just to clarify, in the 60s, this country has gone through shortages, recruitment, and reengineering. I was recruited 40 years ago. When I came in 1984, nurses had been recruited in the 60s and 70s. They formed the Jamaica Nurses Group of New York, an incorporated organization. So they are Caribbeans who came as professionals, and many times it's the woman who came got the job, and the men came. So I know the statement was made, not being sexist, factual. Registered nurses, it's said in some um, Jamaican groups, we are the second top export of Jamaica, second to reggae. All across this country, the Jamaican nurses exported. We were recruited to England in the 60s, here in the 60s, I came in 94, 80s, 90s, 12. So we have professionals who have come here as Caribbeans. Oh now yeah, abs to, absolutely. I was I was just talking about the early 1920s, okay. the period I, that I I'm was just, talking about. I'm just saying because there is record from from the 50s and 60s that we were recruited here. And the second point is Shirley Chisholm, uh, she's Bar Barbados and Guyanese. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, her father is from Guyana. <laughs> Hi. Um, going back to the de um, defining terms, West Indian and or Caribbean American, an added confusion for me has been being asked if I identify as Latina or not. At first, I was confused by this because I was born in Haiti, and, would, and like Ms. Ms. Mrs. Chisholm, I would go back to my parents here, go, go back to Haiti, and then come back to Brooklyn until I turned 10. My father's family are native to the Dominican Republic, who, so right away he's identified as being Latino. However, Haiti being half of the island of Hispaniola and located within the Latin American area, I have started check, checking the box as Latina. Mm -hmm. 
For the forms that only ask for race, I've gotten into the habit of checking other and writing in the human race. However, identifying, <laughs> identifying as Haitian American. In your research, how have you dealt with those terms in terms of I, I, if you're Latina, if you're born in the West Indies, or if you're Caribbean, identify Caribbean? So how have you guys dealt with that? This has been such an in interesting conversation in <laughs> academia because we study in fields yeah. and there's been a real conversation around is studying particular parts of the Caribbean, like Haiti, part of Latin America. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if either of you have thoughts. Do you want to declare a team here and now <laughs> in Brooklyn today? I mean, it's actually not come up so much in my own research, yeah. but I think part, part, of, uh, part of the issue, there's many things going on here, but part of it, of course, are census categories, mm -hmm. right? And as scholars, particularly as historians, we rely on the census categories. That's actually one of the challenges, Taisha could probably speak to this yeah. even more than me, of actually tracking where people come from and are, how they are categorized in the actual record, the official record of, of uh, immigration authorities and so forth. So that's an issue. Then, of course, those census categories have changed over time and continue to change. There's a political question, right? Because why are we checking boxes in the first place? What is, what is that? It has to do with resources primarily, right? Either who doesn't have resources, who needs resources, and so forth. And so there's, and there are questions of political solidarity. There are questions of uh, political rivalries. I mean, great. I mean, the anti-Haitian racism and things like that. You know, in the DR and so forth. So I mean, it's it's obviously very complex. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but uh, just to say, my own research hasn't really come up. Um, but I certainly see this also not only just in academia, generally speaking, but also with my students, right? This generation who are more you know, in, in their teens and twenties who are trying to navigate these racial categories, which which are racial and ethnic categories, which are changing over time, and 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 they themselves is oftentimes being being um, uh, what we call, think of as second generation immigrants, trying to figure out where they fit and what box they should check. Yeah, it, uh, it, the same, it hasn't really come up in my research because I study the earlier period of Caribbean immigration, that first wave of Caribbean immigration. So the issue I have is not even finding West Indians or Caribbean people in the archive. They're still being, um, the period that I'm looking at, the early period, they're still being categorized as British subjects. And so I don't even have, I don't have that box um, yet. But when I talk about it in my, um, when we, when I teach it in my classes and we talk about that period, we do bring up this idea of what it means um, politically to check that box Latin or Latino or Latinx. Um, and it comes up with my students, especially from the Dominican Republic who are Afro-Latino or from Panama, right? Um, and they have those questions as well. Yeah. So just a follow up. Um, earlier there was conversation about a melting pot and I'm not sure if there is a Caribbean melting pot or if there ever was one. So that's really my question. I'm of Haitian background as well. Um, been away from the city for a while, just returning. But in terms of before the boxes, so back in the early 20th century, was there strife between the groups? I, I'm, I don't know the answer to that. And because- The West, today, West Indian groups? The West Indian yeah. groups. Okay. And, and um, so it, this conversation has been a good conversation, but it just feels like everything was so wonderful and happy. We're, <laughs> and I don't get that sense that it was, but I don't have enough history. So I'd like to hear from both of you, from your experiences, and if, if that tension it still exists today. So I would say um, the period that I look at when we when I initially start looking at these groups, especially the mutual aid society, I think that's a good marker of where people's ideas of their identity was, because a lot of the groups start off um, as individual na uh, island nations. So you'll have the Antigua Progressive Society and the Bermuda this and the uh, Jamaican this. And then as they move further into the decades, we see uh, the West Indian Mutual Aid Society or the Caribbean American this or that. And so I think while initially there are these like very siloed identities that Caribbean immigrants have, because as I mentioned, for many people, while yes, this was a second migration um, for a lot of Caribbean immigrants um, in the, at the turn of the 20th century, 
Um, this is a lot of people's first migration. And so, that, again, this is the first time they're meeting someone from outside of their island, um, especially some of the farther islands um, meeting each other in the diaspora. And so then we begin to see a cooperation and a shared identity. And it's, per I hate to say it, but it's particularly uh, juxtaposed to African Americans, right? Because they know they don't have as many shared traditions with African Americans. And so they come together with each other because of this, especially in the Anglophone Caribbean, the shared British identity that they have. So no, it wasn't all hunky-dory, but we do see a lot of cooperation, I hate to say it, against <laughs> the local African American population. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, I think there are all kinds of rivalries and tensions and, and whatnot. And, and part of that has to do with the kind of circulation of various kinds of stereotypes about people from different islands, right? And so re reputations uh, that people uh, carried with them or, 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 or held, you know, Barbadians were this way, Jamaicans were rough, you know, Trinidadians were this way. And so definitely see you know, before and even in the forging of some kind of Caribbean American identity, mm -hmm. Um, people holding really rough to those kinds of ideas about who folks from these other islands were, who they could be, what their politics were, what their class aspirations were, um, what their kind of economic uh, motivations might have been in, in various situations. And then on top of that, layered on top of that, not only are you dealing with the, with the kind of general racism of this country, but then uh, in, interacting with black Americans who come from this, this different set of traditions and some, in many, most cases have been here longer, um, and so, yes, it hasn't always been uh, smooth and, or, or, or clean, um, and, but it also hasn't been linear. Like it just yeah. gets better over time because yeah. different people come over different yeah. generations, people mm -hmm. move out, new people come and so on and so forth. And one thing I just would add to that as well, that especially, you know, we're three historians sitting up here, that there's an issue of archives and memory too, mm -hmm. that I would encounter a lot in doing my research where I would read a newspaper article that says this particular school had disciplinary issues between the Haitians and Panamanians. Mm -hmm. And then you'd interview someone who went to that school and they would say, no, we always, always got along, yeah. you know, that there were no issues. So there's a self-selecting mm -hmm. of which memories get recorded mm -hmm. and also a way that people's memories just change over time. Maybe mm -hmm. something that felt really Really important and urgent to you at 16 kind of doesn't feel that important. Those divisions or that identity has changed as you get older. And so the way that you report it later on in life also um, changes. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, hi. Oh. Uh, I understand that your scholarship has focused on African um, Afro-Caribbean people. But in looking at immigration, have you looked at any patterns of the Indians and the Chinese who also have um, immigrated pretty, um, you know, pretty, um, quite a few of them, um, certainly to, to Canada, certainly here, and um, to, to England. So I just wanted to know if even peripherally in your research, you have looked at who they would, when they get here, you know, who they sort of associate with and so on. Not in my, not in my research. I don't know if you. Not, not, not in mine as well. But, but again, I think that's a really important thing yeah. to acknowledge is that, you know, we talked about sort of language divisions, but you know, obviously the kind of Indo-Caribbean community, whether Guyanese or Trini or else or, or otherwise are, are vibrant. They're in, they're in Brooklyn, they're in Queens. Yeah. Um, and, and it's a really important community, but I haven't, my own research hasn't, hasn't been part of it. Yeah. Hello. Oh. Is it possible that I could answer the lady's question about Haiti and being Afro-Latino for a second? Um, as a professor in Black Studies, Haitians are the original Afro-Latinos, and also as a Afro-Latina adjacent, I would say Haiti is the core of Latin America. But my question is, in your research, have you seen the connection of the Caribbean coast, meaning Central American interactions with the Caribbean, not only um, intimate spaces such as parties and jobs, but also celebrations. As you have said that it was the second wave of migration first starting in Central America. So how do we see 
that second wave really playing out in racial and social economics dynamics? So in my, um, in my work, because I study the earlier period, there isn't as much, um, especially from Central America, there isn't as much migration to New York City because I also, I focus on New York City. But when we look at Florida and places um, in the Southern US, there is more of an integration and um, migration there. Um, but I'm not at the point where, in my work where we, uh, where they have cooperation um, between um, Central American migrants um, and the Anglophone, say the Anglophone Caribbean. I mean, just to, just to pick up on a point that Dominique made earlier, I mean, I think there is a kind of flourishing within ac academic fields, in Caribbean studies, in Af Africana or, or black studies, history of really mining these connections, kind of moving beyond the kind of traditional categories, which, which were really narrowly focused on English speaking, West Indian, and very sociological, a little bit anthropo anthropological, and really trying to think about this more broadly. The book that comes to mind, uh, to deal with some of this is Laura Putnam's Radical Moves, uh, which is just a phenomenal book. I love teaching it, and it really talks about this kind of circum, uh, circum uh, migration through the Caribbean, touching on on the coast um, in the kind of early early part of the 20th century. Uh, so that's a book I would recommend. That's not my. Own. I would also say Frank Garidi's uh, Forging Diaspora is another good one that talks about. Um, about those uh, connections that are being forged uh, between uh, Anglophone Caribbean and uh, Hispanophone Caribbean migrants. I have a question. Are we still using a melting pot terminology? I thought we had sort of moved away from that where groups are holding on to their own identity. So could you explain that to me? the melting pot metaphor. And also um, a question that uh, I, I wanted to put to you both as well as the, the melting pot, the mosaic, and also like even the wave terminology mm -hmm. we use, I think has um, has been discussed as is that so, so useful and that kind of thing. So these metaphors, how useful do they feel or how much are we moving beyond them? I definitely think we're moving beyond the idea of melting pot and maybe a melange, a mix, right? <laughs> Where people are not necessarily shedding their identities, but incorporating them um, in larger ways with other uh, groups. I think I try to stay away from that idea of a melting pot. Um, because again, as I mentioned, um, even in my book, uh, I these people are holding on very tightly to their identities. So they're um, island-specific identities, larger Caribbean identity, at the same time gaining uh, this black American identity. And so they're very transnational in the way that they're looking at um, home and looking at uh, the black world in general. And so the groups that I study, uh, not only are they working with African-American groups, but they're also sending aid back to uh, the Caribbean when there's a hurricane or helping to build a school or an orphanage, right? Um, so there's this idea that they're still very much, while they're attaining this new American or black or Caribbean American identity, they're still holding on very tightly to their uh, island specific identities as well. So I wouldn't say melting pot in the sense that they're losing this identity, but gaining new new identities. And diaspora becomes, they're, they're overlapping diasporas that are occurring. Um, even when we think of a figure like Arturo Schomburg, right? Um, he's, he's like collecting all the identities he can. Um, and I think that's really important because that makes him and influences his thinking and his ideas going forward. Hi, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Um, my name is Marissa. Um, my research focuses on Haitian women's migration to Cuba. And so something um, that like, I think one of you said that really intrigued me was this idea of migration not being linear and a lot of people migrating from their island to other islands um, for labor and then migrating to the US. I'm wondering like, when those people arrived in the US, how did they conceptualize their identity, especially as like in places like Panama or like with Haitians in Cuba, there was like multiple generations that may have come up in those islands. Are they identifying with like their diasporic like 
homeland of like Haiti or Jamaica? Are they identifying as Jamaican Panamanians? Are they identifying with just like blackness and Caribbeanness more generally? I'm wondering like about like identity construction in that way and if there's, if you have any insight there. Um, Cause if you do, that might like inspire a whole new <laughs> like, wedge of my research. <laughs> I mean, I guess my initial response is simply that it's very difficult to generalize. Yeah. I, think it's, I think you have to be quite specific on a person's experience or at least the, the, the context and the circumstances of their, of their migration. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that blackness as a general category tends to be what people gravitate towards by sort of by choice. Uh, I mean, some, some do, but I think uh, that becomes, I think, less... Um, less likely, as at least as a kind of initial, initially. Um, but I think it really just depends on the circumstances in which people, you know, under which people move, um, and you know whether they are intending to stay. They have you know designs on returning home. Whether they're traveling by themselves, are they traveling? You know, or, you know, are they are they being met by a family member or someone from from one community or another? There's so many different factors I think um, that would uh, shape how people. Uh, would end up self-identifying. Unfortunately, this is the hard part about uh, researching and studying identity. <laughs> it's all personal, right? And so everyone has a different experience and everyone has a different experience, even in the same family, if they have the same exact circumstances, how they identify um, with the homeland or with the, the host country and back and forth is gonna be different. And so as Joshua said, it's really hard to make broad generalizations. Um, so I'm sorry. <laughs> means we need more research. But means we need more research <laughs> and more oral history. <laughs> we have time for one more question. One more question. Good evening. Um, so my question actually has to do with the migration of the Caribbean community from Harlem to Brooklyn. And I'd like to just have a little bit more information of why, why Brooklyn and why Bed-Stuy? Because I think that's where the conversation originally started. Um, and so I'm really curious about that. Thank you. One thing that I think is not a generalization is that Caribbean immigrants and Caribbean people in general have a quest and a need and a desire to own land or own property. And so Brooklyn was seen as the Mecca, right? Uh, especially a place like Bed-Stuy that had all these beautiful brownstones. Um, there was a period after the 1930s where Harlem becomes, as you mentioned, Joshua, overcrowded, overrun, uh, not super, exp very, very expensive. Um, and so Caribbean immigrants looking for this uh, new place where they can potentially own property and have a piece of the US, of US uh, land look to more affordable options. And Brooklyn is one of the places that a lot of black Americans are also moving, but then we see Caribbean immigrants moving in mass also, and then some also migrating directly to Brooklyn, right? Um, for this opportunity of home ownership. I think that's that's the that's the best answer. Really, is 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 a, is a kind of simple kind of property question. I mean, Harlem is so overcrowded. It's like I, I was reading a statistic. There was in ni 1935, there was one block that was identified in Harlem that had over 3,700 people identified living in it. One block, right? I mean, that's the the intensity of the kind of overcrowding, right? And so because. The, the, the boundaries of Harlem are really circumscribed, you know, in a very specific way. And so Brooklyn is kind of opening up. There's another factor that many people know, which is the completion of the A train, right? Which creates this, this, this you know, rapid, little rapid transit that kind of connects Harlem, which had by that point, you know, been not only a, a kind of commercial center, but also a cultural center for, for, for black people, both uh, Caribbean and, and not. Um, so it made Brooklyn more accessible. And now obviously accessibility is just jobs in Manhattan, right? It made that much more possible. You have these brownstones, which are, you know, kind of many of them sort of a little bit decaying, right? They're, they're built for a different kind of person, different kind of family with different, different means. And by the, by the, by the depression, we're very difficult to upkeep. Um, and we're starting to be split up into multifamily units. Um, so all these factors are, are kind of at play at once, but I think that sense of that, that kind of quest for property, um, or at least the possibility of it, not, not everyone attained it, but at least, the, at least the, the prospect seemed much more viable in central Brooklyn than it did in Harlem uh, in the 30s, 40s, and beyond. 
Awesome. Well, I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. I want to thank both of our uh, panelists today for talking a little bit more about their research. And wishing everyone a very happy and safe uh, West Indian Day Parade weekend. Get out there, show your flag, show your pride, and celebrate Caribbean history in Brooklyn. Thank you so much. <laughs>